This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Bill Fick Ford and the WCRA. Oh, and a little rodeo called The American. Guys, Cowboy Channel and RFD TV are coming off of a record breaking year thanks to the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo having been in Arlington. Well, that's over. That's done. It was great. It was fun. We were there. We saw. We came. We went. Boom. It's 2021, though. And it's time for the American, presented by Durango Boots. Going forward as planned, March 6th through the 7th at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington, right across the street from where the NFR was. Go to SeatGeek.com today to get your tickets. There has not been this much rodeo talent under the same roof, well, since the NFR. But there's even more of them this time. It's great. Haley Kinzel, Stetson Wright, Sage Kimsey, you name the cowboy or cowgirl, they are here. For more information about the American, please visit AmericanRodeo.com. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the number one Super Duty dealer in the country for the fourth year in a row. You guys have heard me rant and rave about Bill Fick Ford for the absolute best buying experience in the car industry, truck industry. Bill Fick Ford's the place to go. I bet you remember the old ad where I said I was getting a new Super Duty. Well, here's the keys for that. Bill Fick Ford delivers, guys. Noble discounts, noble interest rates, the best buying experience you can get. And if you are not local to Huntsville or the Houston area, he'll deliver it to you just like he did to me. Bill Fick Ford. If I say, who wants to be a millionaire? Would anybody not put their hand up? Of course not, especially in rodeo. Well, thanks to the WCRA, the dream of a $1 million purse has finally come true. You can win $1 million by nominating your rides and runs and earning points with the WCRA. Through the Triple Crown of Rodeo, the WCRA will award a $1 million cash prize to any athlete or collection of athletes who wins first place in any three consecutive WCRA major rodeos. $1 million up for grabs, which is pretty much unheard of. Rodeo Corpus Christi will be the very first stop in the 2021 Triple Crown of Rodeo. The event will pay over $540,000. $540,000. Yes, I said it. $545,000 and will be held on May 6th through May 9th. There will be zero entry fees. That's right. You don't even have to pay to enter this rodeo. The only thing you have to do to qualify for the Triple Crown of Rodeo event is by nominating your rides or runs with the WCRA. Here's the common misconception with the WCRA it's just for the pros, for the elites. Well, if you can hang with these people, but maybe. Maybe you don't want to commit to Pro Rodeo. I get it. I get it. It's a big commitment. The WCRA is made for people like you because you can enter these events, nominate your rodeos, and win crazy money, just like Rodeo Corpus Crispy and this million dollars we keep talking about. To learn more, just visit triplecrownofrodeo.com. Again, that's triplecrownofrodeo.com to see how you can earn a spot at Rodeo Corpus Crispy and possibly be the rodeo's next millionaire. Pow! This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we've got Danielle Campbell, who is a NFR qualifier. She's a fraternity horse trainer. She's been in the game a long time, and this might be the horsiest, most high-level horse talk podcast we've ever done was just the right place and the right time and the right person so we got into it pretty deep Uh, i like danielle she's funny she wears a very specific ring which you'll find out about but yeah check it out answering yeah it got rained on and then i didn't have time to wash it i was like shit. i wasn't expecting the rain today maybe i should have looked at the weather it was in the forecast so had you looked you would have expected it yeah yeah probably why i don't (laughs) i didn't even know that the snow mania or whatever they were calling it was coming that surprised me was so much more intense than i ever could have imagined did they absolutely destroy things for you it was rough yeah we were still fixing pipes today still hauling water to horses like you still don't have water i have water but just pipes are busted all through my property so there's still probably over 20 horses we have to haul water to daily god yeah Tomorrow, I'm hoping tomorrow we're gonna actually be flowing the way it really? needs to be. But it was, it was rough. I never lost electricity though. Really, kept electricity, but so did we. zero water. And we're actually hooked up to the grid. We don't have a well. Like we tie okay. into city water because we're close to town. Okay. And just found out that we are using. Found this out yesterday. Over a thousand gallons of water a day. So like some, your pl- underground. Yep. 
It was like 50,000 gallons of water. The city drove out and oh. was like, hey, just so you know, wow. why are you using so much water? Is the toilet running? It must be a really big toilet. Uh, no, it's not. Like, yeah. I, uh, I've i been on, I've had city water most of the places I've lived since I moved to Texas. And yeah. it is unreal what a little leak will do. Like, all of a sudden, you have an $800 a month water bill. It's insanity. And I have absolutely no idea how it happened. So Somebody, like, didn't. Put that table yeah i had a pool at one place and that guy like before i actually lived there i was like kind of building stuff and whatnot so the pool guy was still coming and he would like leave the water on mm -hmm. to fill the pool it to me it was apparent no one lived there but apparently he thought someone's going to come home and turn it off i don't know but he did it three different times and it was whole place flooded how did the conversation go when you finally let him go? It okay. wasn't it wasn't great and I did let him go too. They offered to pay half of one of the bills and I was like and they're <laughs> like, "Well, it's not our responsibility to turn it off." And same thing, I'm like, "It is apparent no one is living in that home. Mm -hmm. Like the place is empty. No one's living there. I don't live there yet." Yeah. So, but that's whatever. Not, that's not not fun on the barrel racer budget. No, <laughs> the horse trainer budget. Yeah, which not very many people know that as well as you. You've been, you just said, last time I saw you was at Fort Smith when you were eight years old. Uh, may, maybe eight. I, maybe not. I don't know how, I don't know how old you would have been. Not, I mean, <laughs> the last time I went to Fort Smith was a long time ago. What year were you born? I don't want to say that on the air. Everyone knows we're your age. Just say it. Air. Are we on the air? Absolutely. You don't have your headphones on, so you look silly, but yeah, you've been talking this whole time. No, I probably look better without them. I don't know. I feel like I'm gonna look but, silly with them. No, you don't. You like, sound you sound better with them, actually. Okay, so put they them on the now. Sound. Are we ready? We we've, we've been going. Okay. Ty's been going Amazing. this whole time. That's how we I feel started. Like I need somebody to check and make sure my hair doesn't look stupid because that does look stupid. No, not at all. Riley, where are you? you I kind of I kind of have one of those foreheads that you actually have to have hair. You know, I can't like slick it back. It's like a five head. Oh, well, yeah, pretty much. I got with, that with some curvature to it. Uh -huh. So yeah, I can't see from there. You're gonna have to. There you go. Yep. Now you're set. <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs> now, when they capture the unsuspecting photos that go all over social media, oh, right? Well, you'll exactly. Be ready. Well, I got this new foundation yesterday, so I was really excited. I was like, "Yeah, I actually do like this. Good thing I got it yesterday." And someone's like, "Isn't this a podcast?" I said, "Well, yes, but there are some clips that I will be oh, seen. No, possibly no, the whole thing goes on YouTube. The, whole, the thing. whole thing is on YouTube, so I have to be on point the entire time. Yeah, in 4K, it's so a lot everything of pressure. Shows up, is it? It's a lot of pressure. Yeah." yeah. Hello. yesterday was miserable because the heat was stuck on. Is that when Fallon did hers? Because I heard you guys talking about how hot it was the entire time. There were puddles. Sweat puddles. Nice. We took, we took, we took hydration. Is that breaks. what you meant when you said glitter? No, I meant glitter, glitter. <laughs> okay, it's Fallon. just you know, Glitter, <laughs> glitter, glitter. She was cool though. She is. Honestly, I am a, f I, I am a huge Fallon Taylor fan mm -hmm. for a multitude of reasons. I am so. too. I am too. But. I don't think she thinks very many people like her. I think she'd be no. surprised. Do you know, I actually, again, I commented on this with a few people um, after I listened to it. I was like, I was surprised at how the tone of a lot of the podcast was nobody likes her. And I'm like, I don't get that. And I know that she has haters. And I know that people want to say things. They say it about everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. But All it you have was to do is win or do something that's out of the ordinary. Anything or be upset. prettier than the next person or it doesn't matter. But you're always going to offend somebody. But I don't, I don't know that she truly does understand how many people really respect so much about her and what she's overcome to be who she is today. Like I have the utmost respect for her. She's overcome a lot of challenges, so. Yeah, yeah. Her attitude or just about everything is really surprising. I, I even asked her. Like, I tried to get her so many times. It's like, I'm going to drop it. She is uh, one of on. the most intelligent people. On. And, I mean, years ago, I mean, the first year she went to the NFR, and this dates everybody in here, especially me, because I was older than her at the time. But in 1995, like, I rodeoed quite a bit with her. Um, not necessarily the same rig, but same rodeo, spent a lot of time together and my dad was driving me and her dad was driving her. So, I mean, we followed each other and went places and I mean, for 12 years old, highly intelligent, so smart. Right. So always has been. So like the success that she has is no surprise whatsoever.
No. And, like, and she just like saw this void in the market, like at least our industry. She's like, yes. Okay, I see these. Everybody else doing She didn't say this. This is my assumption. Right. I see everybody else in other industries doing this. Why don't we do this in rodeo? Exactly. What I liked about uh, her podcast with you and the interview, I can't remember everything word for word, but maybe somebody tweeted or did something about I'm at a barrel race and something to the effect of everybody's been exposed to foul and I, it wasn't like that but the same thing and i yeah. and they said it in a negative way on the tweet but i was like that's what i actually find cool like i and i guess we all might kind of like laugh about it i mean i did a clinic in maine last year and i was like everybody had foul and taylor everything and as a matter of fact i sent her a text really? telling her that yeah i was like i'm in maine doing a clinic and everything is foul and taylor like what it doesn't it like? matter what is the horse industry like in maine uh, it's got to be weird as hell, right? Quite different. And I always, I, I am the world's worst. I never, I have the worst filter. I don't have a filter. So I'm learning to try to have one mm. when I'm actually going to speak and other people are going to hear me. It was interesting. There are some nice horses up there. But as of, as a whole, I will say they, they do need clinicians to come up there. I really? guess that's probably the best way to put it is they do be need like that in that whole area. Clinic right? Yes. Like Which I mean, there are like, I know Maine isn't necessarily New York, but I mean, there's a lot of really successful barrel racers in the Northeast and futurity trainers and, and whatnot. So it's there. Quebec is quite tough. I mean, if yeah. you want to go a little bit further North, but it does. Well, like Troy and Brandon were all from like, I guess Ohio. Right, Ohio, and, but uh, Brandon's from Vermont, Maryland. Maryland, yeah. yeah. So in crap. Pennsylvania, all of that, they're full of good trainers, great yeah. horses. Like I've spent a few summers ago, four summers ago, I guess, I spent some time up there and I rodeoed a little bit. I have clients in Pennsylvania and I went and rode with Brandon some and whatnot because like any trainer, you always want to keep learning. So if you right. can go spend time with people and learn and whatnot, that's a plus. Yeah, Brandon's so, a G too. Oh yeah, he's he's legit. Like he's an amazing trainer, an amazing jockey, and like one of the absolute coolest, funniest individuals I've ever been around. Which I don't. He's kind of quiet, a little bit introverted. I don't think most people would really realize that about him. I don't him. think anybody would really know what Brandon's probably like. Um, I just happen to know a lot of people who know him really, really well. Right. Because I actually don't know him great. Well, he has a spent a lot bit. of time with your dad. A lot of time with and Kelly, but I don't think they're friends, but him and Ivy are friends. Okay, yeah. see, I don't even realize that, but I yeah. will say one thing, because I'm always about giving people credit. Like, Brandon told me that, like, Kelly has taught him probably more than anybody else in his career. Mm, so, there's a, pretty big compliment. People can say whatever they want about Kelly, but the, that dude is probably the number one horse repairman who's ever existed i think he's a phenomenal hand as a matter of fact he's about to do that clinic in georgia yeah and i mean i even made a comment on the facebook post about it like what an incredible hand he is and he's always willing to help i mean even a couple years ago in buckeye at a futurity i mean i yeah. i've sought him out like well, I give mean, me some advice I like help me on you've this known horse. my parents forever so ever yes again aging ourselves but yeah, forever. I know how old my parents are it definitely shows how old your young parents for are being my parents, and uh, yeah well and i mean yeah they had you so late in life which is why you are so young yeah, yeah. exactly yeah I so do i don't know what that was <laughs> call me old no, I was yeah. saying you're very young. Yeah. That, that was a nice compliment. <laughs> you're very welcome. Except for Ty's like 14, so it makes me feel old. Uh, Ty does look young. How old is Ty? Ty is 22. 22? He is just a spring chicken. He is. He has yeah. not lived much life. No. Outside of the wide world He's, internet. He is getting educated on this podcast, I'm sure, having rodeo people coming in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is interesting. I, I kind of want to go back to what we were talking about, right? Because... I mean, you had mentioned that you were rodeoing in the early 90s, and, and at that time that Fallon was doing it. I mean, that the world's a lot different now. but Very. And then you talked about rodeoing on the East Coast, and the interesting thing that I find about Texas, right, or, or like rodeo and the separation of rodeo from fraternities, that's changing a little bit. But, I mean, when we when I was a little kid, it was there were they were two different worlds so far apart. Like mm -hmm. rodeo and fraternity, like especially on the East Coast where we lived. right a different thing so i mean you've done both right like you've made runs in rodeo but also right everything else so i just would be interested to hear kind of your perspective on the evolution of both things um i feel like rodeos changed i feel like back when i was rodeoing we had a lot more fun than what i imagine girls the age we were do i mean i started i mean 
the first year I went to the finals was also the first year Angie Metters, Molly Powell, Fallon all went to the NFR. Of course, Alan or Fallon was a little younger than us, but I mean, we had a good time. Like things just seem different. I mean, even Angie and I will still talk about like, there's no way these girls are having as good a time as we used to have. And um, other than that, I, I don't know. I feel like it was a lot more people enjoy themselves. The rodeos were more fun. I mean, you had like the Houston Astrodome, places you don't get a rodeo anymore, but everybody went there and the formats they have at those bigger rodeos now, not everybody's there at the same time where it used to be we were. So it was just, I mean, everybody got together, everybody hung out. We had a good time. I mean, you went to the the bar, whatever, for lack of a better place to go. It doesn't matter if you drink or not. I mean, went to the bar, hung out, and I mean, just the camaraderie just seemed a lot different than what it is now. I didn't ever feel like it was cutthroat. Like, you hear so many people talk about it being cutthroat, and rodeo people, you can't be friends with them, and I never felt that way. Like, I developed friendship. I mean, still to this day, one of my all-time best friends is Jamie Steiner, and we met rodeoing. I introduced her and Sid to each other, you know? I mean, those friendships, they lasted a lifetime and it was just cool. It was good times back then. And I don't rodeo enough now to really know how much it changes. I mean, without getting kind of political or whatnot, I will tell you one thing. I think the ground has gotten worse at rodeos when I do go rodeo. I'm shocked that that hasn't improved as it goes. It's gotten worse. And that's one of the reasons I don't rodeo a lot. Like, I think you got to know your horse and you know, if you have the kind of horse that can handle the elements that are going to get thrown at you. And if you don't, to me, there's no sense in going. So there are things. And I mean, even on Fallon's podcast, I heard her talking about the difference in prize money. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Again, I don't rodeo a lot, but I mean, I won Denver in 1995 and won $14,000. And I'm pretty sure it really doesn't pay much more than that now. Right. Well, not this year, but I mean, zero this year, (laughs) it paid zero this year. They won nothing, (laughs) but, um, I know uh, last year was a different format, but a couple years ago it was about the same. And I don't really recall it ever paying that much different. And I'm just like, what? And she's correct. Like, what a huge difference. Now, futurities, on the other hand, some of them don't pay as well as they used to, but they don't get the entries. And I think the like introduction of four and five D races kind of took a hold of that and made it so so many people. I mean, m- remember when Fort Smith, because you've been there, used to get 700 a- entries or whatnot. Yeah, it would f- go all day all night and it would pay over a hundred thousand to win first because of the amount of entries it all feels different now like even bfa and just the whole it doesn't feel as and maybe it was because back in like the early 2000s i was a young kid seeing so everything seemed more grand right and sitting on a horse for your parents in the in the alley just felt different than like being an adult grown man at those things i agree but with they you. just they felt so grand they had the mm-hmm. speed horses and and granted, we were on the East Coast, and every barrel race on the East Coast had 400 entries. And I think you were you were pulling out of the barrel races at three, four in the morning because right. they had four or five hundred entries. Right. And I don't know. I mean, obviously they have that in Texas, but they still do. They have huge races, but they're four and five Ds. Are they're not so much futurities anymore? Yes. I feel like the futurities, even though it's what I do, it's what I choose to do. And like this year in particular, because of the breeders' incentives, that was my next question. There's more money to be won with a futurity horse right now than there ever has been. However, in my opinion, when you talk about BFA, when you talk about Fort Smith, I loved the speed horse futurities. They were incredible. They were so much fun, but they seemed more prestigious back then. And uh, just what you said, like it seemed grand. It, it did. It seemed it, they did pay better. They were bigger. And now we do have more futurity. So maybe that takes away from some of the bigger ones. But entry wise, I really think it's the sport has grown so much and it's become so every year you see a few people maybe you've never heard of that kind of decide to train a horse and pop up whatnot or, or newcomers getting involved. But I think it's intimidated a lot of people and made them not want to spend the money to enter same with and the market stay home. Though, right? oh yes yeah like it, it's really hard to be a stallion owner right now like oh, because if I you're had not to sell mine yeah because yeah. if you're not in the breeder like nobody wants to breed even though it's mm-hmm. there's some amazing horses out there that aren't paid up right because frankly just your average person could just can't afford to pay up into pink buckle every year no not at all it goes right Royal back Crown to and the whole deal like it's crazy yeah takes money to make money so and i'm not saying crazy bad but just crazy in general oh it's it's crazy um it's it depends on who you are if it's good or bad but it is like I said I mean I I raised and owned a stallion and he's super cool and when all that stuff started picking up and I realized hey it's imperative that he be paid into this 
I was not in a financial situation to do it. I was in the process of trying to buy a place and whatnot. So selling him kind of helped do that, but also made it so his new owners can actually put him in those programs where I couldn't. So it was better all around for him. It just makes it kind of dire, though, like in a way to, to try to own because like my dad was obsessed with breeding programs. Mm-hmm. Still is. I mean... It, it's it's very unobtainable for someone who trains horses for a living, right? Who, frankly, those are the people who should be raising the great studs. But, exactly. I mean, I just I went through my entire childhood, and, and you went through, I mean, a lot of your life probably thinking similar things to, like, what I kind of grew up seeing. And, like, the goal was always to raise a good stud and have your own in-house breeding program. Yep. And then all of a sudden, here comes these incentives, and, you know, 50000 80000 Easy. And per year, and that, that's just not going to work. And all of a sudden, right. you have this stallion who was on the up, right? Mm-hmm. And on the rise, and like this unbelievable stallion, but he's not paid up. So all of a right. sudden, nobody's talking about him anymore. Yep. Yeah. And I'm referring to one specific stallion of ours, but it's a lot of other ones too. It is a lot. And, and it is tough. And, and not, honestly, some of those programs are a little bit political. It's who you know, just like anything like that. I mean, it it doesn't matter what you're involved in. Politics are going to become involved, but it's, uh, it's political as to what stallions get in and which ones don't. And, and it's difficult to, you know, it's a hard pill to swallow that that's the way it is, but it is the way it is. It just happened really quick. It feels like a very overnight, like once that first pink buckle happened and people saw the amount of money it paid, which is great. Like I also train and compete. So for me as a competitor, those are awesome because it gives us more money to run at. And I'm lucky that basically everything I'm running right now happens to be in the pink buckle as well as almost every other incentive that there is. But on the flip side, as a breeder, it really makes you sit back and look at what you can breed to. What some of the stallions I love are in any incentives. I love race horses. I love riding a race horse. There's hardly any race horses in the pink buckle. There are some, but not very many. So when I go and buy a prospect, which I like to buy them off the track generally, which is an old thing now. Yes, it's we spent our pe- whole summer on the track. All I want, I, I love race horses. I love the race horse industry and, and quarter horses off the track. Like that's where all my horses came from the whole no, time. No, you can growing lift up upper and lips whatnot. up, and you never see tattoos anymore. No, everything is, and I'm not saying this in a negative way. So don't anybody, people who know me would probably think I was, but I'm not. But everything is so barrel racing bloodlines. It's Frenchman's guy, firewater flip, Frenchman's guy far water flip people tend to forget dash to fame as a racehorse i mean he is the greatest barrel horse sire in my opinion that there will ever be nothing will ever compare to him but he's a racehorse himself and he was brilliantly marketed horses. to become that yes he was and as a trainer i mean you can feel they they tend to be hot horses like mentally you wouldn't think that's what you wanted but they are so freakishly athletic and in my opinion it's their flexibility that makes them so great when you train horses you tend to figure when you present something to them that's easy they're more likely to go do it and for me turning barrels is easy for a dash to fame because of their flexibility and just overall low hawks they're athletic there's a lot of athletic horses out there but dash to fames are freakishly flexible it's like i mean I don't know. People in Cirque du Soleil, I'm not going to pinpoint any ethnicity here, but you know, if they're going to be flipping and doing somersaults, it's easy for them because they're able to do it. I, you're not going to see me attempting to do that anytime soon because it's not easy. But with barrel horses, Dash to Fames win because it's easy for them, plain and simple. It's not because they have great minds or whatnot, but um, I don't even know where I was going with that. I tend to start well, I mean, so trails, I really, but... really, really like to talk about the track because it just feels like a dead thing to me. Oh, like, I'm so worried that quarter horse racing is going to be the next Greyhounds. Right? Um, it is a little scary with what's going on. I mean, I ride for some people that basically that's all they do is racing quarter horses and quite successful with it and whatnot. And I train uh, some of their horses when they come off the track. And it's a little scary when you see it because I love it. Uh, same thing. I mean, it's... And that's where all of our horses used to come from. But that's where I was going with that is I used to go claim horses off the track, buy horses off the track. And now you can't hardly do that because who's going to buy them after that? Like if I need to sell one, even if it's not a coal, it's something I like, but I, I need to buy feed or whatever. You know, I've got a house payment to make. Now I can't sell that horse because it's not in any of these incentives. And it might be a great horse, but it doesn't even get the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting and it's changed so much. And 
I'm not up to snuff on racehorses anymore, but I, I just wonder what that market is like with horses off the track. I mean, just in that industry only. I mean, what what is the breeding programs currently looking like on the track? Like, what is the number one producing sire right now? What's the crop of horses on the track right now? And it's just sad that you can't pull from that. I think the racehorse sales themselves are higher than they've ever been. And there are certain things about that. I mean, some people love it. Some people hate it. But, I mean, match racing is huge. So in Mexico and whatnot. So even if horses are going to go there. But that has raised the market as far as what those horses can sell for. And even coming off the track here, their marketability generated towards that has definitely gone up because that's raised so much but barrel horse wise i mean i really think unless it's a trace sace or i mean like fairy of the winds are kind of a big deal right now to get those but they're those aren't huge on the track but it's almost impossible to find a really nice trace sace off the track but those are really the only racehorse sires that barrel racer that that are generated towards horse racing that barrel racers are now wanting also yeah, yeah. I just wonder if it creates an interesting opportunity for somebody to acquire, like with the untouchability, right? Like maybe mm -hmm. not fraternity horse, but rodeo horses certainly like have nothing to do with these. Right. You know, I just wonder, I mean, there's got to be a bunch of AAA horses out there that are not being utilized for this industry at all. A hundred percent. Cause now nobody wants them because they're not in any incentives. Yeah. And a lot of it, I mean, it, because barrel horse breeding has grown so much. I mean, all of my clients, almost every one of them wants a barrel bred horse so they don't go buying off the track they don't really even seek horses that are purely race bred today i had a um tempting dash and a fury of the wind both off the track on my hot walker and i just took a video because i'm like this is a rare thing to see in a trainer's you know barn nowadays to see straight up race horses i mean i've uh, not very many tempting dashes i don't think have even been tried but He's one of my favorite three-year-olds. So, right. but there you go. And I think he's in one incentive or maybe first on the waiting list for one of the incentives, but again, not anything, but he got sent to me from a client, the same ones that have race horses and whatnot. Otherwise he didn't ever come my way. But I think there's a lot of talent out there that doesn't get utilized. And as a trainer, you start to get a little closed minded too, because I mean, there are certain bloodlines that do have a bad reputation of actually being good minded and training well, but then kind of losing it when it, they add speed. So as a trainer, you don't really want to spend all this time training a horse just to find out that when it's time to compete, they can't keep their cool. They, they don't actually go in and perform at a high rate of speed. So those horses all get overlooked now. And that's one of the most popular race bloodlines there are at this moment. So there's a lot of stuff that isn't even remotely getting tried that I think used to because we didn't used to have barrel bloodlines. You either rode a cutter that was a coal or a racehorse that was a coal. That's what we had as barrel racers. You could either choose to be broken fancy or there's no substitute for speed. Let's go fast and hope they turn. And I always wanted to go fast and hope they turned. Right. That's interesting. Because uh, we're talking like as far as timeline, just it's such a short time period. Right. So it's hard to wrap your head around and you just, you start going down like a rabbit hole, like if you can make certain things happen and, and utilize things at a certain price point, because barrel horses are for your layman, right? Yep. Your person who enters the open barrel races day in and day out or goes to the winter series at whatever place in the United States, mm -hmm. there's a million of them. They're breaking their backs at blue collar, some white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, to try to get a decent barrel horse so they can go perform and hopefully like, get one of the four saddles they get at the end of the winter series. And right. so there's this huge demographic of people who maybe doesn't even care about breeders incentives, but there might be an opportunity for them to acquire nice horses by talking about these things because no one talks about it. Right. I agree with you. And I think if it's somebody that wants to go to the NFR and just rodeo, they don't necessarily care how a horse is bred. But I am astonished at how many people, and mostly what you read on Facebook, that are looking for a horse that's already going. They don't have a lot of money to spend. And when I say not a lot of money to spend, to some people it's a lot. But barrel racer standards, not a ton. They want something already running in the twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 range, which generally is not going to buy you a current top winning horse. But they all want it to be pink or ruby buckle, pink or ruby buckle. So again, you have one that's not pink or ruby buckle that's really nice that's going to fit that person and they're going to be able to do well on, but they won't even look at it just because it's not in those incentives. And I've always wondered how many of those people are actually going to go to the pink buckle 
Like when it rolls around every fall, how many are going to enter up and drive down there? But everybody wants it. So yeah, because it's the tr- I mean, it's probably a trend that's not going anywhere. Let's be real. Mm-hmm. Um, unless there was like some mass exodus from, you know, from these incentives. But I, don't, I doubt that. This is like the new right the way of, of living. I'm sure it's going to just continue to go up and up. But one would assume. But you do wonder how many stallion owners are going to continue to be able to afford to do it because. As they continue to go, and I'm not saying some of these are going to die out, but definitely the stallions in them are. Because eventually, these stallions that got in at the beginning, if they aren't seeing the dividends coming back to them, just like anything in life, they're going to have to drop out. So at what point do you start running out of stallions? And I'm not I'm not singling out any incentive whatsoever. I'm just saying the amount of them that we currently have and the cost that it is to put a horse in every single one once owners aren't seeing that money coming back, stallion owners, something's got to give. And even the breeders who don't own a stallion, I mean, you're forced to breed to all the stallions in these. So then you start paying at a young age into this. And I mean, there's so many complaints at how much money it costs every year just to keep the colts paid into it before you actually sell them. So all the way around, people are going to have to see that money coming back to them. Someone besides the current owner and the person jockeying the horse at that race that are winning the money, they have to see the money coming back in order for them to survive. And that's just going to take a few years and time to see what happens. But it's hard to believe so many can sustain and keep going. Yeah, we're also just looking at a small amount of time, though. Like if, if we're talking another decade past now, a lot of these big places that are doing it, I mean, I know some people who just pour and I'm out of Colorado, pour just a mass amount. Mm-hmm. Just a mass amount into it. Right. You know, hauling 12 rigs up there, just ridiculous things. That's yep. probably an exaggeration, three rigs. But you know what I mean? And it's just Plenty. unbelievable. So I wonder if there, there's going to be people who are actually even ballsy enough to produce fraternities because that's a tough thing to do. You know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't most of the time. A hundred percent. Your if, ground has to be impeccable. Everything has to be impeccable. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to complain. There's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. Because now you have social media. Yep. And you can't hide from that. Yeah, I mean, we just saw it with the royal crown. This, this, people got absolutely crucified. It that they, was hard to see. It was it was hard to see. This is a, it's a touchy subject for me because yeah. I was there. Yeah. So I don't know if you, it, it was hard to see that many horses running in those conditions. Yeah. It was a hard futurity to watch. And um, it was, it was, ugly. I mean, we could be very, Frank and say it was ugly. I it, didn't. I don't know what they were supposed to do in that in their situation, but it was ugly. It the result. Yes, it it was extremely unfortunate, is what it was, and it was. And I love the people that run the Royal Crown. I mean, I've known them for years, and it was it was unfortunate, but it something. I don't know what they're supposed to do either. Apparently, they had a really good ground crew that has done the ground in that arena before. One thing I will say about Texas is, I mean, there's a lot of clay. And there's a lot of moisture in the air. Yeah, clay, no, wet it's not, clay packs. It's not Rapid City. No. It's like a different thing. This packs. And I am a huge fan of the Black Widow drag. A lot of people in Texas hate it because people don't know how to use it. And they pull the teeth up so it's not ripping. And they're heavy drags. And they, they're they made to pack as right. well as rip. So you pull the teeth up, pretty soon you're packing. And I don't know what could have been done, but there was a lot of equipment there at Bryan that did not get used um, other than the Black Widows. And it, it like I said, it was just very unfortunate. It was hard to watch them get crucified on social media because – producing event like that does take a lot and you don't want to complain so much that people stop producing them but i do think people need to understand that you have to go over and above like at what point do you not say stop stop everything i don't care if it takes five hours we're gonna fix this and make it safe um but the only time during an actual race it got stopped was when Craig Brooks broke his foot, yeah. you know, and then they, they stopped. And unfortunately it's, it, maybe it was too little too late. I don't know, but the ground still didn't improve after that. I mean, horses were still falling afterwards. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really hard to produce a race because people yeah. will complain and sometimes rightfully so. In that situation, I mean, uh, unfortunately you can't really go any other direction, but like this is out of control a little bit. Right. What have it? I mean, no one could have forecasted that it was going to be that cold here and all that. Oh, no. It does different things 
when you have humidity like this. The weather here, I know uh, Jamie Steiner and I, I mean, she's from Washington State. I'm from Utah slash California. And we come here and they love water in Texas. They love, you will never go to an event in Texas and see dust ever. And I'm like, don't you miss dust? Like, don't you miss just seeing some dust, like dirt that will actually kind of move and have a little bit of give because we do have so much clay and then they water it. And even if it's, even if it's a foot deep, it's sticky. And I've never seen more injuries in the state in Texas since I moved to Texas. I've never seen so many injured horses, random stuff that I've never even heard of that horses running here get. I've never seen or heard of in my life or dealt with before I moved here. So, yeah, it's I mean, almost dirt like is they, a big thing. They almost just look at, at like the ground here and they just want it to look good. They want it to look good. They want, like I said, I don't know their infatuation with water. Like I don't feel like water, that much water is necessary for good ground. But water and clay, it's a, I mean, I think you have to be so precise, and I'm not a ground expert by any means whatsoever. It's hard to I'm me because it's so subjective. It is. It all depends. But you have to know the ground you're working with, period. But I don't go to a lot of races in Texas It's simply because I don't want to complain about the dirt, but I know I'm going to if I go. So I just sit at home and do my little thing and pick and choose where I'll haul my horses to. And, like again, it's just unfortunate that an event the size of the Royal Crown had to deal with something like that. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what kind of effects it has on the, the deal in Rock Springs. But. Agreed, as people wanting to go or not go, or people maybe never going back to Bryan again for any event that's held there, you know? I mean, you... Yeah, they may look as producers and be like, hey, we don't go there. Right. Maybe, maybe they move it. Yeah, and I, probably a smart move on their part is to not go there. Yeah. So, again... Because there's if no that heat inside happened, that building, right? Is that... No, it's not even enclosed. I yeah, mean, it, it, was, it might it appear a... enclosed on the video. I'm not sure, but it's... It's not. So, I mean, they get the elements from outside for yeah. sure. Yeah. So. There's a lot of better places. Of course, they cost a lot more too. Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know that Brian is a super inexpensive facility yeah. to rent from what I've heard. Really? But yeah, I don't know. Mm. Mm, I don't know. That's just, it's just a, a messy thing. But, yeah. you know, when you have somebody like Craig break his foot, that's a, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a hard deal. I don't know if I've ever seen somebody break their foot. It's hard to see. I saw Jolie Montgomery break her foot in Buckeye. Oh, yeah. Kind of same deal, her leg or something. But, yeah, her horse was just started to turn the third barrel and lost it, and she she broke something. And yeah. And she's got right back on and kept running, basically. She's Somebody broke their collarbone not that long ago. Yeah, Jolene's scary. Her arms scare me. She's Jolene is she's a freak of nature. She's insane. She's awesome. She really is. Like she's, she's, I have so much respect for her as a, as a competitor and a trainer. It's insane. Yeah, super humble. Very too. humble and works hard. Like works hard. Yeah, that which pretty group. much anyone who wins to that degree does. You're not going to win at this day and age unless you put forth the work and work that hard. But she definitely does not mind having her butt in the saddle. Like almost no. every time you see her at an event, she's riding. She's training. She's She's working on something, and it shows. That's why she wins the way she does. Yeah. I mean, give her a few more years, she might go down as number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. she's going to be in contention with Cassie Mowry on that one. Yeah. Troy, though. Can't ever forget about old Troy. Well, Troy's one of the greatest there will ever be, but, I mean, people are probably going to surpass him in actual earnings. But, I mean, Troy's going to be one of my all-time favorite. I mean, I still, when I refer to, I mean, it, it can change every day, but we all have our own opinions. And as far as, like, futurity riders, I mean, to me, Troy and Cassie, I just, I put them so high up on a pedestal. And, I mean, Cassie's in her prime. Some people may argue and say Troy's prime is a little bit behind him. I think he's still as good as he ever was. Um, just maybe not as dominant and for a multitude of reasons, the game has changed. I don't think he's riding near as many horses anymore, but on any given older, day, though. he's a lot older, but on any given day, he's still going to outrun you. Like he's still got it. Where Cassie, she's in a prime that seems to be lasting for a really long time. Like her prime is not short lived. It doesn't it, make sense almost. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Because it transcends fraternity. She can go to the NFR. She can come right back. She can win 50,000 at Houston, not care about that. Go right back to fraternity horse. Is. Yeah, just it doesn't matter. She's just got some stuff in her that I don't think most people do. Like she is absolute one of the greatest to ever do the game. Period. So agree. Yeah, Troy though in the early two thousands, I just 
I just remember specifically, like, my mom had this one mare, and she was fighting with Troy all the time, and he was even just just a, just a little bit better with the, with the sissy's little coin. Yeah, sissy. That year was a phenomenal year. Two thousand and one, maybe. It was, I can't remember. He had I don't sissy's geek little out on coin, like as as HL Capro Sprite, but, but yeah, he like, had, he had like six or seven. He was that was a dominant year for him. Like oh, he, he just completely like, dominated in the early two thousands. It was like a three hundred thousand dollar plus year for him. Yeah, or more. Yeah, for sure. And that was before slot races and everything. Yeah, you yeah. know, it I was mean, regular that was, regular money. Yeah, dirty money. Regular money. No slot races. No breeders incentives. Just going out there and kicking ass. Period. There was just a lot of fraternities though. You had all of the all those fraternities and Memphis yeah. and all the speed horses we were talking about. It felt different, and you didn't have Facebook. Right. And I was only a little kid, but I just remember it because my parents, yeah. we were, it's all we did was go to fraternities. There was nothing else to life. Right. We didn't even go to school. Overrated. At the time. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice to have that first grade education back, though. <laughs> it would be nice to be able to read and write. <laughs> I would love that, but, you know, it's too late now. Basic arithmetic tick would be really nice. But you didn't really even, like, have the internet like this. So it was like, what was it? Barrel Horse News was, like, where you got You had to your wait. Info. Every month for the barrel. I can, I still remember and I was telling some people one day, I was like, man, remember when we had to look in the classifieds of the barrel horse news to find horses and prospects for sale and trucks. Yeah. And call Trailers. those people. There was a phone number and you had to call them. You didn't email, you didn't Facebook message, nothing. So it was insane. Times have changed so much. And I'm, I'm one of those older people now that gets to remember all of it. I remember having no cell phones, you know? Like, no cell phones. I can remember staying at Christy Peterson's house during Denver one year, having to use her phone to, you know, call people. No cell phones. It's the damnedest thing. Yeah. Kids nowadays have no idea how it was. We had to walk two miles uphill both ways to school and back in the snow, all that stuff. Like, now we're saying it about social media. Yeah. Technology. That's the one thing, like, I really like. And after going through, like, that weather thing, mm -hmm. like, I'm really happy we live in the time we live. I like it better than like the alternative. I would do away with social media though. I'd be fine if that disappeared. I, I've already spoke about this on a podcast before, but I just think it's, I think it's 99% just pure evil. Like there's a little bit of good that comes from it. Um, I, especially Facebook, I think Facebook is pure evil. I do like Instagram. I get a lot of entertainment from Instagram. I mean, I've, I use Inst I don't follow very many people I know. I like Instagram because it makes me laugh because I yep. follow accounts that bring me humor throughout the day um, and inspirational ones as well. But whichever, I feel like it actually somewhat feeds my soul, whether it be with intellect or humor, but it does. And I feel like every time I get on Facebook, it actually takes away from me. Like I have a negative feeling when I get off Facebook where Instagram, I have a positive feeling. So I have to go back to the Instagram thing because you get to learn something about people if you pay attention yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. Just by looking at like the little like thing on certain pages. Right. I sure see your name a lot on some of the raunchy ones. I so knew you were going there with that just oh now. You, wow. You. And I think that sometimes too, I'm like, if I press like, who's going to know that I pressed like on this? But then you know if they know, then they do it too. Right. They're looking at it too. They just didn't have the nerve to press like. And I did. I'm throwing it out there like, yeah. Yeah. I like this shit made me laugh. You follow a lot of meme pages that I, I also follow. So. I follow a lot of meme pages. May have not seen you in quite some time, but you got a sick sense of humor, lady. Well, I mean, thank you, I think. It's a compliment nowadays. Thank you. Well, I just think it's important to be well-rounded and have a sense of humor and any, you know, a lot of different things make me laugh. I also share constant posts of baby elephants playing. So really? that's the flip side. Yeah. If you, like, is there if like you, a if you look at my story, uh, there is. And if you read my story, you'd get that. Sometimes daily there's elephant posts on there. So. What's the obsession with elephants? I'm sure I've seen them, but um, I didn't realize it. I don't know when it began, but I, you know when it probably started is I've always loved elephants. Like I think they're so majestic and great and I don't really get caught up in much animal rights stuff or whatever, but I do pay attention to like elephant poaching and I think it's horrible. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question real quick? I hope I know the answer to it. Have you ever been to Jamie Monroe's house? No. Oh, never mind then. Does she have elephant tusks? Mm-mm. Oh. Feet. Really? Yeah. So I'll I'll get remind me to get into that in just a second. Um, 
where was I going? Oh, I read the book Water for Elephants. Um, obviously, it got turned into a movie, but I read the book first. And I can't even remember the author's name because I don't remember anything anymore. I can't remember song titles, authors, most book names, most movie names. I can't remember anything. Sarah Grunin. Thank you so much. She's a brilliant, brilliant writer, by the that way. That was fast on the Google. That you was. You just knew? I enjoyed that. I Googled it, but I also remember I read it for like my first semester of college. She wrote a book. Uh, I will do this often. You'll find out. She wrote a book. Maybe you can look it up really quick if you're Googling. And I think it was Near the Water's Edge or The Water's Edge or something like that. Maybe the best book. One of the greatest books I've ever read as far mm. as fiction. Um, brilliant writer. But... That book made me absolutely 100% fall in love with elephants because it went into just the brain and the intellect of them. And it was about circus elephants and mm -hmm. one in particular, but it made me love them. And I just think they're adorable and cute and, and whatnot. But, um, so I do going to Jimmy Monroe's, I have friends that had tusks also, um, I'm I'm probably going to make myself sound like an idiot here because I'm not as educated as I should be. It's like I don't follow politics, but I always have an opinion, but it may not be an educated opinion. Is there are quite a lot of things. I mean, I'm going to admit this here on air. I have two saddles that have elephant seats in them. Yeah. And I really struggled with that. And then the more research you do, the more you, you find out that there are elephants that died of natural causes and everything is, is harvested in a way and the, the proceeds go to act, generally go to actually like, like into preserves and that to actually help elephants. Actually, in that. all of that money, um, there, there's laws. Like if you go over and you, let's say they've got an old bull elephant that's right. about to pass away. What they do is they auction off that hunt for like nearly a million dollars. And it goes into it goes actually... into the conservation right. of elephants, maintaining their habitats, and also to feed the people who live in those areas. And I am 100% on board and cool with that. It's I think it's the illegal poaching that drives me crazy. So I'm not one of those people that every time... I mean, I personally don't hunt. I love guns. I like to shoot. I shot a hog a year and a half ago, and I cried when I got my picture taken bad. with it. it. Made me feel bad. It really did. But I have nothing against hunters. I mean, again, I was born in Canada. I'm from Utah. Now I'm in Texas. Everyone I know hunts. Like I have nothing against it, but it's just not for me. So I'm not that person that sees a a lion or anything, you know, and and makes judgment as to how that got killed or what happened or when people post pictures of themselves with like their their trophy kill or whatnot, like congratulations happy for him it's not for me but so with the elephants like i don't have a problem with anything like that and i do agree that it's a huge industry for them to have stuff like that happen and i think if people would do more research and understand that well and so that's the big misconception i have a lot of friends who go to africa and hunt right and um that's the huge misconception what they don't realize is that if we like we meaning americans don't pour that money into there and go and do all that right then you are literally setting that place up to get poached yep uncontrollably yep it's the I only thing that. that prevents it so mm -hmm. the hunters that you're mad about for going over there are literally the only people preventing said elephants rhinos lions go down the list of the animals from being poached right when you're willing to put well into six figures into going and getting that trophy yeah where do you, i don't know who they where they think that money's going they, but. they just they just think oh, white man who kills bad but this yes. is also white, white. man bad yeah. orange man bad <laughs> yeah but this is also just white people who live in silicon valley they have no idea right you know yeah they just don't and if, if you take away all that conservation from hunting into africa millions upon millions of dollars of revenue that goes to pay for all these people's way of life, because there's no industry there, None right? You know, whatsoever. There's, there's a lot of wildlife, like, drug lords, and 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 these outfits that rampage these people uh, of their same race, and, and some of them are it's over religious things, but mostly it's just to cause terror, based on what I've been told. And these are the things that actually help prevent that, right? Take that away because what well, you don't understand anything, right? Let me circle all the way back so that people aren't like mad at the Monroes. They, they owned a circus like her family did and so there was just they're like an homage to the elephants mm -hmm. that passed away is all it was so no one shot one right well that's why i was saying like a, that wasn't gonna offend me yeah that she had that 
Yeah. Because I was just curious if you saw something. it. No, never had. Yeah. No. I remember it was actually the Steiners that had tusks. It was a gift from somebody. Then they had elephant tusks in their home when they lived down in Bastrop. Mm-hmm. So, and they were beautiful, like beautiful. And yeah. I'm sure we're harvested the way that they needed to be you know everything was on the up and up so to be able to get them here legally they'd have to be right yeah, yeah. steiners are so such good people they're uh, they're, they're they're just cool yeah. cool people it's, it's cool they're good, all cool great family cool they people cool. yeah let's see we talked about elephants we talked about memes we talked about a lot of actually i think we've talked more barrel horse stuff with you than everybody else combined i know i was a little bit i actually told a girl that i trained for on the way here and i was like well i don't know he, s- he sat right there on the one i listened to and said he doesn't really like to talk about barrel racing or rodeo so i don't know what we're going to talk about because i don't really think you i'm not interesting but i am and i do cuss some so you you can edit this out right no we don't edit oh, okay well then in that case i was like but i am a freaking delight so i just didn't really say it that I don't way think freaking is a curse word well, that's because that isn't how I worded it when I told her. Uh, so. What is it, Ty? How many fucks are we allowed to say on the show? Four? <laughs> unlimited. We haven't said one it's yet. It's an un- unlimited. Yeah. Well, I actually was laughing over the cursing issue that Fallon said she had because I feel, I mean, it's, <laughs> I struggle with it at times, but I'm very good at not cursing when I need to not curse. So, and I try, I try not to, like if I ever share something on social media that has a curse word, I'll usually like cross it out and whatnot. Like you try to, and I'm not in the position that she is by any means. I don't have the following that she does, but you still try to be respectful. And that's why when I do clinics, I love to go to Australia. It's my favorite place to do clinics. Australia is? Yeah, because for a multitude of reasons, but because I can have whatever vocabulary I choose and I'm not going to offend anybody. Because they're so rough and tumble. Oh, over they... They teach me words I didn't even know. I mean, yeah, I've got a whole new vocabulary since being down there. Really? Yeah. 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 What was it? Uh, we had a pastor on. Why can't I think of Jordan's last name? I feel like an idiot. I call somebody my friend, but I don't remember their last Weaver. name. Weaver. Weaver. Jordan Weaver. Weaver. Why couldn't I think of Jordan's last name? Anyway, he's like he's like my favorite pastor, right? And he does like that. He does a, a beef program with cows and all that. But he said something really interesting about curse words to me. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was. This. No, no. He was like, don't ever censor. He said, don't ever censor yourself. But that, uh, you know, those words didn't really exist with, like based on the, the reasons that we're creating to not use them. Like, mm. it might be a little silly. Well, my opinion on cursing is if people say freak, which I just did, freaking, friggin', fudge, whatever, what is the difference? Obviously, you mean the same thing your, in your head. head is in the exact same place. So what actually made that word a curse word? If your thought process in your head, so I I try to not generally be like, oh, I'm a, oh, fooey, darn it, or whatever. Usually if I'm going to curse, fooey. I just go ahead and do it. And I mean, I, again, I grew up in Utah, so that was like the absolute ultimate and like instead of a lot of people said oh my hell there that was the phrase in utah oh my hell instead of what's the, what's the difference between your hell and my hell i wonder i don't know but it was always their own hell yeah their so own idea it was never hell. your hell it was never like oh hell it was like oh my hell it was personalized so i don't know hmm. what is your personal hell now i'm curious my personal hell was texas last week <laughs> <laughs> hell froze over Touché. literally that was my personal hell yeah there's supposed to be different circles of the, circles of hell and one of them's like a frozen yeah thing. that and probably a few relationships i've been in i definitely have my own ideas of personal hell <laughs> but texas last week and i don't want to hear any northerners tell me how cold it is where they are i had more instagram people texting me or, or messaging me on instagram because i made the mistake once of posting like our temperature I'm like, this is not about the temperature. It's about the infrastructure. This you is about the fact we're in Texas and they are not built for this. My property is not built for this. Most people have no power. We all have livestock. We're not prepared for this whatsoever. I mean, we have rolling blackouts going on. Did like, you get into the conspiracy stuff about what was going on? No, I didn't. You know, I try not to get into it. It has nothing to do with politics one way or the other, but I try really hard not to get caught up in conspiracy theories because it will 
it will, excuse me, it will fuck with your head. It hurts. Yeah. So I try not to because I'm like, I can't function in life if I put this much thought into this. Ryan Padone, I don't know how she can function on a daily basis being a horse trainer is into the politics and and whatnot as she gets she which i is praise so her serious about it she is and i i think it's awesome and so educated and too. that's the thing i think it's awesome because but that's what i mean she puts a lot into it and i don't know how anyone can have time to do both like i have no idea because i know she rides horses for about 22 hours a day and sleeps about two hours so i don't know how she is as educated as she is but I mean, I respect her for it. But I, my brain, it can't function that way, period. So, yeah. Are you an eight hour? You got to have your eight hours of sleep kind of person. Now I do. I didn't used to, but the older I get, the more I love sleep. Like I, I need to sleep. I get a, I get hooked on a few Netflix series here and there that definitely takes away from that. Like I will get where I just. It'll be four in the morning and I won't realize it. And I'm still watching. I'm that person. <laughs> I And I hate that person. And I'm that person. Ty, you look like you wanted to speak. That's my life every day, honestly. Netflix. So he's this weird, like, what generation? I'm, and I'm like literally in the middle between Gen Z and millennials. Yeah, whatever that means. But millennials are millennials older than you is the most am. part, right? Yeah. What am I? I think I'm Gen X, maybe. Am I Generation X? I don't I don't know it. That's the problem. I get confused. Oh, so, so it's Gen X, Millennials, which are technically Gen Y, and then Gen Z. Okay. And then something after Gen Z. So do we go back to Gen A? I'm is Gen X. Let me look. I don't know. What was before a Gen X? A baby boomer? I believe that's right. Trying to use his radio voice. Did you catch that? Yeah. Is it a good radio voice or a bad? So it radio goes. Voice? It's it's actually it's pretty decent. See? It's it's remotely pleasant to listen to. Again, I worked oh. in radio for like five years. Okay. So it goes from silent, which are like seventy four, ninety one years, uh, boomers, Generation X, millennials, Generation Z. I'm an X, I believe. Hmm. That seems like a longer <laughs> period of time than the others. X. Yeah, um, they ran that for a, for a while. A long time, yes. I why. saw this not too... Here we go. Here if it, here's the, so here's the years, if you want... Generation X so baby went boomers for 14 go, years. So baby boomers go from 46 to 64 in terms of birth year. Uh, Generation X is 65 to 79. Uh, ex, I'm guessing they're trying to blend stuff in. That doesn't make sense. Why? Yeah, I don't know. This one's a bad site. I'll keep that up for you guys. But that's got, super handy though to have that. But why why does Generation X cross over Xennials or whatever the heck? I have that no is? clue. That doesn't make sense. This is a bunk list. Oh, it I does know. cross over. So if I was smart, I'd say I was an Xennial instead of a Generation X because it gives me like six more years to work with on my age there. Was there any point in your life where you said you were the same age for a couple of years or a few years? No, I, I'll joke about it more than anything. Like I'll, I'll kind of make so jokes about my age. I was thinking about doing that for a while. And I think most people do. Do they? I've never really had a meltdown. Like on any birthday, I've never had a meltdown. Like I had a friend who just turned 30 and had a meltdown and I'm laughing hysterically over it. Right. However, the other night I'm in the shower. This is not a dirty story by any means. This is not X-rated. I'm in the shower, and sometimes, I don't know if anyone else ever gets these random thoughts, but sometimes I'll think of my name, like my own name, and how it's spelled, and I'll be like, that's really strange. It's really strange that my name is Danielle. It's really, I, I don't know. Did you call your mom after? No, but um, I have asked if they were high when they decided to spell my name, because it's <laughs> actually spelled D-A-N hyphen capital Y E L L E is on my birth certificate. They wanted you to get made fun of. So at I'm Dan Yell or Dan Dash Yell or anything like the the people who actually know how my name is spelled. They always have something great. So I'm just like, where did this come from? Like, why is there a hyphen in the middle of my name? I don't understand. So I need to put a hyphen on the title of this episode. You, people will not know who it is whatsoever. <laughs> they will not. She doesn't know. spell it like that. But I love the fact that I know I just spell it with the Y. And I love it. I like that my name is unique enough to have a Y in it. And I dropped the hyphen and the capital Y on my own. So I, for a while, I just went by Danny. 
And then, and what got me doing that is when I was um, eight years old, we moved from New Mexico to Southern California and I had like really long blonde, pretty hair. I mean, not to brag, but I had long blonde, pretty hair and my mom, and she would die if she heard me say this, but it doesn't matter because I've told her to her face and the truth is the truth. I wish I could find a picture. Um, She cut all my hair off and permed it and I had a mullet. I had a permed mullet. So when I, I, the mullet and no, I probably do somewhere, but it doesn't really show that I had a mullet. Like I have a little ball cap on, but it is a permed mullet a hundred percent. And she keeps saying it wasn't a mullet. It wasn't a mullet. And I just had blonde, perfectly stick straight hair. So I start school in Palm desert, California. So very uppity little place and community. And of course my name it, is, did you grow up in the city? Like, yeah, town? for a while. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Like total city there for a few years because I didn't grow up with horses at all. Um, and my name, Dan Dash Yell. So everyone thought I was a boy because I have a, a little mullet and it appears that my name is Dan, not Danielle. And I'm like, something's got to give. So I became Danny for a while. And then I just was Danielle dropped the hyphen. You had to do what so you got to do. That was a history of my name right there. Which oh, so why did you get into horses? Goes back to, oh, but goes back to the, the age thing and the shower thing. Because again, I go down like different trails as I talk here. But um, kind of had a little meltdown, like thinking of my age. I was all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, I'm going to turn such and such this year. I can't believe this. I was, well, I'm going to turn 45. Year? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. turn 45 this year. And I'm just like, what is... And then you start thinking of all the things you don't have in your life, considering you're 45 years old. Like you tend to not think of what you've accomplished, where you've been, what you've seen, who you've influenced, the great things you've done. But, and I'm sure it's with everybody, no matter what. I mean, I can sit there and I have friends who are my age or even a little younger that have families and have kids that are kind of like, I never got to do this. I think everybody has their own little meltdown, no matter what it is about the things that they have not accomplished in life. But I'm like, I don't have kids. I don't have a husband. Uh, none of this. Like, I'm just out here solo hauling water to 43 horses <laughs> because Texas is shut down and iced over. So this is my life right now. But so anyways, so into horses. Um, I, always, I just always wanted a horse. And we grew up racing motorcycles. And my brother had a tragic accident. And he was kind of the number one in the family. Like he was the only one that really had a chance Mm -hmm. older at a professional career. He was the reason we moved to California was for him to pursue his career. And he was extremely talented. Um, And shortly after we moved there, he just, he had a tragic racing accident that ended his career. And that was unfortunately for him and, unfortunately for me is that was kind of the window of opportunity for me to get involved in horses. So. Are your parents the type of people who like put everything into their kids? They did. Absolutely. Like they did everything. Uh, like Again, our move and our move to Utah was uh, really about the horses and myself. When we first moved there, I was in high school and that generated around, you know, they had a really great high school rodeo program in Utah. And um, we had befriended a, a few trainers, you know, in, in Utah and Idaho and people that I I could train under and work with to try to get better. So that move was about that. They have since long moved back to California. So they still reside there. But um, I mean, Utah was a, a great experience to be able to move there, but it was, it surrounded me. So yeah, they put everything they can. And it wasn't financial. Like it wasn't, um, it was never, they, they were never, still aren't wealthy people, you know, um, but just anything they could to support me in order to achieve my dreams, which generally meant sending me to somebody who did know what they were doing and could teach me to train my own horses. I mean, from the get go, uh, I mean, when I was 16, I had a little mare named pants on fire that, I mean, I was still in high school, obviously at 16, but she was uh, the number three futurity or highest earning futurity horse of that year. Um, and then it was the very next year that, let's see, that was 94. So 95, I went to the NFR on her and another horse I'd actually purchased with the money that pants on fire won. And that was Helen at the moon. So, um, kind of always for the most part, either had to train my own or, you know, where it came to Mooney by my own. And, but I've always had a huge passion for training and making my own for the most part. Is that why you just kind of 
decided not to pursue rodeo hardcore? I think so. Cause even back then again, I mean, I had pants on fire. She was a two year old that we got off the track. Um, so she actually came by way of Sue Smith, Sue Smith founder from Idaho. I mean, way back then was a good friend and still one of my very best friends in the world, but she actually had found her and that's how we got her. And I got her, I think, uh, December of her two year old year. So right before she turned three and, um, had a cutting trainer there in St. George, Utah, that helped me to get a good handle put on her and, and get her started. Right. You know, so I could start her on the barrels, but so I think early on when you have that deal where you, you you get a little bit of success and get to take a horse through those stages and then enjoy the success that they bring you. It, it, for me, that was more addicting than anything. And to this day, it still is like I get way more satisfaction out of the little things at home that nobody else sees training a horse and the improvements that they make. And when the light, you know, the little light switch goes on and they, they grasp something and you feel this cool move that they have and you start to imagine what they're going to be like running. I mean, when I breed horses, I imagine what that horse's style is going to be. So that's what really drives me and keeps me going. I love to compete. Rodeos are fun. I mean, you like the crowd. I thrive off the energy, but I think that's why I didn't just full-time chase rodeoing. Even when I had the horses to do it, I always wanted to be home and I wanted to be training horses. So it went back and forth. Yeah. And I'm grateful that I've been able to do both because I do enjoy both, but the true passion is in training horses. Yeah. I, I mean, there's several people who like Jolene's one of those people who has yeah. the same passion as you, but there, there's not like a ton of people. Cause how old were you when you were like, I'm going to be a horse trainer? Um, Probably there, like my late teens, where I really realized, I mean, there were other things in life that interested me that I wanted to do. And it was really more, not even as much my parents as it was my dad that was like 100%, like, this is your livelihood, this is what you're going to do. And for someone who wasn't a horse person, but I think... And I mean, and I've said this before, so for those who have heard me say this or heard other podcasts, I mean, sorry to repeat myself, but I think it was really cool that my dad could see that that was what I was truly passionate about. And he actually discouraged me from going to college. He thought it was a waste of time for where I needed to be in my life. And that's not for everybody, but especially now college is like. Seems like a bad idea now. It's there's so many ways to make money and be an entrepreneur without having to go to college, without having to have a degree. Like there's so many people who are so well off that have no college education whatsoever. But a lot of people want to have jobs that do require one. And I mean, I think to each their own. But it was cool in my situation. That, I mean, because I have so many friends with college degrees that have never had a real job, which I trust me. Last week, I realized having horses and being a trainer, it's a real job. It's more of a real job than any so hard. desk job could ever be. So it always makes me laugh when people say real job because I'm like, yeah, you have, yeah, I, I get to ride horses. It's so fun. It's 15 below with the wind chill and I'm outside for seven hours straight. Or it's 110 with 98% humidity and I'm outside working. So yeah, super fun. People who have never rode like five three-year-olds in a row in one day will never understand. Oh man, how. I'm telling you. I have a group of three-year-olds and they'd had a little bit of time off over the winter and they weren't super broke or started on the barrels to begin with. But I mean, they gave me an ass whipping for like a week straight of riding. I mean, I'm talking like getting whipped around and not bucking, but just swapping leads and jumping and leaping and this way and that way. And I'm, and I would, I would get off and I would be so sore and I'm just like, I cannot believe this is what I chose to do for a living. But again, then all of a sudden you get on them the next day and they're riding it around doing everything. Yeah. Yes. And you're like, and this is why I do it. And then you get to send videos to the owners and they're thrilled and they're happy and everybody has their hopes up of what's to come. And, and that's what drives us and keeps us going. But for me, like that's why there was no college or anything is it was like, this is what I was passionate about. And my dad recognized that. And again, he discouraged me from going. I liked broadcasting and journalism and whatnot, but it was, like I wasn't going to be successful in both fields it would have been impossible to do so and because either one you would have to put in everything you had so at that point I'd already had some success in training barrel horses and rodeoing for that matter so it just seemed like that was the path my life was going to take it's a decision that I'm grateful for yet regret on a daily basis (laughs) 
I understand that because there yeah. was a point in my life where I was like, I'm never going to ride Colts for money again. Right. Yeah. You didn't do that. You continued. Bravo. I continued because I realized that I was at the point in my life where this was absolutely the only thing I even remotely knew how to do. And on some days that was questionable. It's a hard yeah. way to go. It is. My favorite people are the people who take like the hardest path and stay with it forever. Yeah. Good, bad, or ugly. Like anybody who sticks with horse training their entire life you got to respect them no matter what your personal opinion is of them for just persevering. Is it because it's, it's we love deal. it or because it's at that point the only thing we can do? Like sometimes well, I'm don't like, get me what wrong. else would I do at this You point? don't have a resume. I was just telling Kelly this. I was like, you're, you'll be riding horses forever because right. no one's going to hire you because you've got 44 years of ride horses. Yep. The layman doesn't even know what that means. Hey, what's no. that ring say? Can you not read it from there? No, I'm blind. I think you can read it, and that's just, why you're I, asking. I, I, I think I can, but I don't know, but I want to hear you say it. You know what it says. I don't know. Ty, you got glasses on. What does it say? Don't say it. I want her to say it. Come on now. Well, I, this I is ridiculous. can't see it from my angle. I extend. <laughs> I invite you here, and you can't even tell me what your ring says. We're I have, having such a great time I have, reconnecting after all these years. I have three king baby rings on, and the middle one says, fuck you. Oh. <laughs> so... It's just the attitude I have to pack with me a little bit because I'm so sweet natured that I have to have a little bit of spice, you know. That's what people say about you. Right. Oh, I'm fully aware. <laughs> this is the nicest <laughs> lady we've ever met. She is just the, she's, like I said, I'm a fucking delight, so. <laughs> you would never guess based on this podcast you were just so polite and informative. I feel like I, I you have been. you here and be crazy, but you didn't. You're I feel so like eloquent I. eloquent for someone who trains horses. Thank you. Thank you. Very well spoken, too. Thank you. Make Ty look dumb, though. That's rude. Oh, come on. Look at all the stuff he's pulling up. I can't remember authors' names, anything, and he's, like, just whipping it out. I, I would not use that term, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. See? My brain has not gone there, so... I know your brain. My drink, didn't, my didn't drink go there. needed to be stronger. <laughs> Actually, nice I caught one, myself. Riley. This could have been way better. I said something a minute ago that I was like, "Oh, I know. I have a few friends that I know are going to hear me say that and take it somewhere completely different than where I the shower it. thing. No, it wasn't the shower thing. I can't remember what it was. So mm. I've gotten to a point where I don't think that, but I I think about it because other people are thinking about it. Yeah. I, I just, normally I would take a shot at Ty, but I decided not to. Right. Move on. All right. I'm going to do it. You're still going to do it's, it. It's so far past, though, because <laughs> she was like, well, you can't see that. And you said, whip it out. I was like, speaking of things you can't see. Speaking <laughs> of, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I'll watch myself from here forward, so. <laughs> yeah, you've kind of been nursing that in a kind of pathetic way. When you were like, I know. Oh, I'll get wild. It and has, it has been a little slow. Oh, well, I told you. What What are you supposed to do? There's a rule. You're supposed to drink the first one, which I have failed to do, sip the second one, and decline the third one. Yeah. There's, considering that's like 80% water at this point. It's well, it, it has melted. It wasn't very strong to begin with. Sorry, Riley. It wasn't. She's wanting me to make a good, like a very good impression. So Should we dock her pay she, for that? She doesn't want me hammered. She hurt the show. <laughs> Huh. Well, you were on a pretty good pretty good track record, but now I'm upset. Well, Fallon didn't drink at all, did she? Fallon doesn't drink. Though. Right, so. Except for she's 15 allergic to or 16 Fif times 15 ever. 15 times ever. I yeah. know, I read that. She promised a 16th next time she comes on the it show. It made though. me laugh when she told me her story about her first NFR, which was also my first NFR. And she said um, that so she had a drink in her hand or something, and somebody said, everyone here wants to see you fail. And I... My first NFR was a horrible, horrible experience. Like any dream of a little girl wanting to go to the NFR was completely shattered by what my experience was. So um, everyone around me was trying to get me to drink to like get over the, the horrific events that were taking place in the arena when my name was called. And so one night I actually did, which I, I do not condone this. And I just want to put that out there. I do not condone this. I, I was underage at the time. I was 19 years old and I did have something to drink and I can never, I'll never forget like the next day, I believe it was like Sharon Smith who was also there. And my dad and her were talking and said something to do with drinking and 
everybody to this day still makes fun of this because the story went rampant of my dad going, alcohol has never touched my daughter's lips and everybody around. Was it an interview? This was not an interview. He was just saying it to people like alcohol has never touched my daughter's lips to like the people who were feeding drinks to me the night before, which of course he had no idea whatsoever. Did his bubble get burst? During the NFR, did he find out years I don't, later? Uh, maybe years later. I don't know that. I don't know that he was that much in denial whatsoever. Like my dad was really strict, but not so much strict on things like that. Like, what was it's it like not bringing that, a boy home in your house? I still don't know if I really ever have, but definitely like wasn't really allowed to date. Um, he was pretty protective going to rodeos and that, like very protective. So there wasn't a whole lot of like bringing boys home whatsoever. Really? Yeah. None? No. Is that just because you were rodeoing and doing the whole thing that you just, there was not a huge access to a lot? Uh, Probably so. Yeah, there wasn't really a whole lot of dating. I mean, like in in high school, I had had a boyfriend. So, I mean, I guess he would come over and like pick me up to go to prom or do whatever like that. But there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of dating. Mm. I didn't date a lot. It's you know, like you met people thing. rodeoing. Yeah, but it was just so different. Like, when you look at people who don't grow up with the lifestyle that we did, it it is a lot different. Like, dating in the real life is very different than dating in the rodeo life. I really enjoyed the non-rodeo aspects of, like, our my life. Because we, we lived in a town that had a huge school. Right. So, like, people didn't even know we rodeoed. Right. No one knew. We just did it on the weekends. No one knew. Yeah. We, our we high liked school, it that way. We didn't want to get made fun of for rodeoing see our high school had a rodeo team and it was pretty cool that sounds cool yeah like they thought it was cool if you rodeoed cowboy stuff's pretty cool in the state of utah though like they love their rodeo it's not anything made fun of now when i went to high school in southern california like i'm pretty sure i was the only person there who rode western period like i knew a few girls that rode english horses but i definitely was the only one that actually like rode western and very few people rode horses at all where utah quite a few people like had some form of a agriculture background or you know a huge understanding of it It was just a lot more the culture in the state of utah than southern california yeah 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 that you get made fun of for being a weird weird horse girl probably yeah 100%. Hundred percent. Because our school was really close to Denver, like inner city Denver. So we was, lived out, and it was just like that was just not the thing. Yeah. We kept it kept it to ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think my sister Paige didn't, but for the most part, we kept it to ourselves. Yeah, that's how I was when I went to school in California. Yeah. It was easier to just not tell people. You don't want to open that door and be called a redneck or something. Yeah. And then exactly. you have to try to defend rodeo because it's not the same thing, but you can't because they don't care. You know? Right. <laughs> no. I know. Even now, I find, like, it's a lot of times it's much easier. Like, if someone just wants to make random small talk and travels, like, let's say I'm flying or at an airport or whatever, and you just meet random people, so much easier not to go into exactly what you do. It's really hard to tell somebody that you train horses for a living. I know, because... Train them to do what? Do you ever talk to somebody you know? who, like, trains other animals? Like dogs? Yes. Or... They're always kind of... I want to meet a dolphin trainer. Yeah, they're always kind of... A little different. And you know that that's what people think that of I, us, I know, too. and that's why it's a weird topic. Yes, like the horse girl. I am the horse girl. The horse woman now. Yeah. So... But it, it's just different, right? Because it just seems cooler because it's our industry. We're like, oh, but it's not that. It's not that. It's this. Right. But to the world, it's totally that. However, now that I live in Texas, though, it is. Like, I can tell anybody that I'm a barrel racer, and they know what it is. I'm not used to that. It's a different kind of place. Yeah, it is for sure. And there's, like, a coolness to it. Like, I like that, but I'm not, like, 24-7 cowgirl. Like, I don't go out where, even when I am riding, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't wear cowboy brand jeans or anything like that. So, but I don't dress cowboyish whatsoever when I go out and do things and I'm not afraid to go to the store with boots on or whatnot you know but I mean I just feel like it's it's something at least how I dress or act gets left behind but I don't at least when you're here you can't actually tell people that you're a barrel racer if you choose to and they know what it is or before you're you're scared to because you don't want to have to explain the whole thing and then go through oh the poor horses and this and that you know what I mean like it's just hard when people don't understand it it's very difficult yeah, I'll never forget kids at the one school that I went to when I lived with Kelly was just like, nice flatbed. 
I've always had this thing. I'll never put a flatbed on my truck. It's like, ah. And now you live in me. Texas. <laughs> they tease me for it. everywhere. <laughs> there are. No one cares. It's such a good place to live. So for a while, and I was so proud. It was years and years ago. I'll tell this story because it is kind of funny. I was rodeoing and I was in the Northwest and I just got a brand new Ford 450. But it was going somewhere else to get a bed put on it. Because 450s didn't actually come with a bed like they do now, like They're a regular chassis, truck bed. Yeah. yeah, and you had to put some form of a bed, which it ended up getting like a somewhat of like a Western Holler type bed, but it wasn't Western Holler. Something brand. you so, can't put hay on the back of. Right, it wasn't a true flat bed, but because I needed a new truck and it didn't come with a bed for quite a while, I had to drive it without any bed whatsoever. Like cabin chassis, no bed whatsoever. Which I don't even so think you're allowed to do anymore. Uh, maybe not, but let me tell you, I rocked it. Like I was not too proud. Like you want to talk about country girl whatsoever. And I'll never forget, I have a flat tire because back in the day, I had a lot of flat tires on this one trailer. It must have had bent axles, but I became a pro. Like NASCAR could have hired me. Like you've never seen a female change a tire as fast as I could change a tire. <laughs> not, uh, yeah, I am proud of it, actually. I'm proud. I was going to say not proud, but I am. But so I'm pulled over and this guy and it's pouring down rain in the northwest, like going from Caldwell to Canby. Right. And this dude pulls over to help. And there's two of them in there and there's a little kid. So everything seems cool. Everything seems safe, you know. And then the one guy who's a little dirtier and grungier than the other one is like so asking questions like where are you going and uh, i mean they're helping me change a flat so of course i'm being nice we'll come to find out he's a hitchhiker and he needs a ride right and i'm like i'm about to become this person like how can i say no and the other dude's vouching for him oh he's been with us with my little girl in the truck everything's fine and it was cool i did give him a ride to portland but uh brand new truck this guy stunk so bad. Like, my truck never did smell the same. Like, you never could get the smell of this guy out of my truck. <laughs> and to my parents, I'm sorry. They have no idea I ever picked up a hitchhiker, but I did. How many hitchhikers have you picked up that's over the That's the years? only one. Really? Yeah, that's the only one. Yeah. And I was kind of, like, somewhat dating this guy at the time. And he rodeoed also. And I was kind of, I was, like, texting. You were like, dating the hitchhiker after, even no, though he no, smelled no, no, bad? No, no, no wonder the truck stayed <laughs> stinky. Yeah, no kidding, right? No, a different guy. Oh. I was dating this other guy. And uh, not the hitchhiker. And I was texting, like, dude, I picked up a hitchhiker and he's freaking out. But anyways, I know people have done worse things. But that's about as edgy as I've ever been, you know, to pick One up a hitchhiker. hitchhiker. One bad. who helped me change a tire. So it's not like I literally just saw it pulled off on the side of the road and was like, Hey buddy, get in. So. Yeah. But yeah, my dad would pick up hitchhikers all the time. It was the worst thing ever. Just to like keep him company or to be nice. Like, was there a selfish reason that he did it or did he do it a hundred percent as a giving human being? No, he was looking for gold teeth. Okay. <laughs> Cause I mean, I know that there are some people that was a good one, by the way, who do it just for their own entertainment. Like, they don't really care that they're helping someone. They just do it for their own no. entertainment. He was always trying to do, like, acts of good kindness. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's a good way to be. Maybe, though, like, for those listening, especially youngsters, don't do something that could potentially, like, get you murdered on the side of the road. Like, if you're going to do an act of kindness, don't pick up hitchhikers. It's different nowadays. People are all freaking weirdos. Yeah. And that, yeah. Yeah. I feel like when I did it, it was like kind of right on the cusp of things changing. But I mean, hitchhiking was probably m much more safe back in the day. Maybe. Never made me feel safe as a kid. <laughs> I wouldn't think it was, I would think it's safer now with the ability to at least have a phone on you at the time compared to like to the 80s where. What's the phone going to do if someone stabs you in the neck? Potentially like, ah, I stopped you. It could tell you where your body is at least. I mean, I don't know. I was Yay. watching the show. Let's look show. at the bright side. I found your dead body <laughs> thanks to your phone. It, there's, a there. there's a exactly. lot. Exactly. Of there's a show on Netflix, and that was it. the girl, like a, a dude picked her up, and she took a picture of him and a picture of the license plate in the car to send to her friend, and they still ended up finding that chick dead. Not the same guy, but they thought it was because of all of that. That's not going to matter to me if I get stabbed in the neck with a knife. I'm right, going to be dead. It doesn't matter if I have an iPhone 12 or nothing. Dead <laughs> is dead. Is at true. least at least your body is not phone. missing. No, no, no. Ty, if you have to start any sentence with the phrase at least, it's not going to be a good thing. 
at least I only pissed my pants and didn't shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> You know, I've never thought of that, but that's a valid point. At least it never leads to something positive. Never. Like it's a justification for something positive, but it's not truly positive. It's, not. it's just drawing attention to the negativity that happened. Yeah. I you guess. You pissed yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What if I true. use the word furthermore? Furthermore is different. It's you proving say, a point. Furthermore, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. You could, you could say, <laughs> I use the word fuck a lot because I do. But Jesus Christ is, furthermore, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. <laughs> furthermore, I am forgiven for all sins and transgressions. Immediately, so. <laughs> depending on what religion you subscribe to. <laughs> I had a Baptist guy knock on my door one time, and he was trying to sell the, are you religious? In a, in Probably a not sense. with the fuck you ring on all that much. But furthermore, Jesus Christ <laughs> is my Lord and Savior. Bingo, so. she picked up on it perfectly. <laughs> You'll use that for the rest of your life. The rest of my life. <laughs> Whatever you have left being a barrel horse trainer at because least, it takes years off of that life. At least I pray every night. You do? In spite of my ring. What do you pray for, though? Like for other people or just like, dear Lord, please help me get that truck that doesn't smell like a dead hitchhiker. No, not that. I don't. I very rarely um, pray for selfish things, especially in a monetary or like something that would result in glory. Like I don't mm -hmm. ever pray to win. I don't believe in it. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of rodeo people who on social media do in some ask for really? prayers to help them win. I'm not going to mention names um, or their spouses get on and pray for so-and-so. To It's like, how selfish are we in this world? Like, I don't ever, I 100% don't believe in that. I have prayed for safety before a run. Um, and that's a lot of what I pray for. But I do. I pray um, at least once a day. I know set times just whenever sometimes I pray randomly I almost got in a huge horse wreck uh, last summer on a horse and like when I was safe when it was done I said a prayer like thank the Lord for being there for me um but no it, it brings me sense and peace I don't attend church but I mean I feel like I do have a relationship with God I'm religious to an extent uh, I don't practice a religion but I'm LDS so I'm Mormon that's what I've been baptized and whatnot, but certainly not practicing as I sit here with my fuck you ring and my alcoholic beverage in my hand. I was going to say, there's several things there that are going to ensure that you are not the god of your own planet. Right, exactly, 100%. But I, I do, um, at least I have a relationship with God and, you know, whatnot, I believe. So, and I feel good, but I pray for, uh, I pray for our military I pray for our leaders, no matter who they are. I pray for Trump. I pray for Biden. I, you know, pray to give them the knowledge to make decisions that help this country be a better place, this world be a better place, and pray for safety of my family and my animals and whatnot. But sometimes I pray for myself to, you know, if I'm going through a rough time, I just pray for strength to get through it, so. Yeah, some pastor told me, it's like, hey, you can pray for help on anything, just don't pray for things directly. Right. And I think, and that's, and I don't like, and I've just prayed for help. Like, please give me strength, you know, yeah. give me strength to get through this, the knowledge I need to get through this and, and but, whatnot. But and it makes me feel better. Not give you know? me cash money. Yeah. Don't yeah. Don't make me rich. Don't do this. I, like I said, I've never prayed to win. I've never prayed for anything like that. And I, I'm, I'm very appalled by people who do. I think it's incredibly selfish and in the midst of what goes on in the world and the people who suffer, like most of us, most of us who are lucky enough, no matter how difficult it is or how poor we are, if we are lucky enough to be able to rodeo or train horses for a living, we're pretty damn blessed. So a lot of people, they're not that fortunate. No. So there's people out there who couldn't own the horse because they'd have to eat the horse. Exactly. And that's reality. And I in think some we, places. yeah. And I think we lose sight of that. I mean, it's, it's a really easy for me to compare myself to, you know, peers who maybe seem to be doing better or, or living a better life or winning more than I am. But at the end of the day, like I pray to God and I thank him for, you know, the blessings that I've received and the, the talents that I've been given that, and being able to go live and do what I do every single day. Cause so many people can't not to get this serious all of a sudden, but that's what I pray for. I want to focus on it, but your ring keeps saying fuck you to me. So it's hard. <laughs> do, you want me, do you want me to put it on the other hand no because then i'll just be looking over there and no longer making eye contact i actually like it but i think that might be a good place to end it just 
What's your ring? Say one more time and we'll cut it right there. Oh, come on now. Don't make me cuss again. <laughs> Every time I, I had this friend and her name's Tammy Childers. She lived right across the street from me when I lived in Utah. And she had this amazing horse. She was 16th in the world one year. Her name was Hummer, this horse. That's a good name. Yeah, it is. It actually was a good name. I think she was by that stallion Humboldt, which is like old school race horse. Mm -hmm. But Tammy basically rode and and someone's going to criticize me on this because I don't know if it's a Bazelle or a Basel or, you know, that rope hackamore thing that goes yeah. around their nose and it would train with a tack collar and run, run in that. And anyways, her and her husband are the coolest, most eccentric redneck people you've ever met and the best people you've ever met in their life. Like if you could handpick any neighbor ever to have, you would want the Childers to be your neighbors. Like they were super cool, but cussed, they had the coolest relationship, but cussed more than anyone I've ever seen in my life. And she won Red Bluff, California one year and it was when it was televised and I mean, she comes back home from winning <laughs> and she goes, I, all I, I was terrified. I was going to say the F word during my interview. So that's me when I know I'm going to be doing something. I try so hard to program myself not to say it. And then you're sitting here trying to get me to say it. Yep. I will so, instigate every and single I have thing. failed. I have failed. I have said it. Was yeah. yeah. But it's kind of like, it would be super hypocritical to not say it if you're announcing it on your finger nobody that can read my nobody can read is also my the ring. fu finger so. i'm not a big jewelry wearer so i don't know but for some reason this if i ever go out like i do wear this and i think it is just to see if anybody notices it i don't know it's a conversation piece in a way it really is but i like it i mean it is something unfortunately that i say quite often a lot of times just to myself I'm pretty, I, I'm not like one of those horse trainers that I feel like is really rough on my horses. Like I very rarely get after them or whatnot, but I'm very verbal with them. Like if they're doing something to anger me, whether than like jerk, like I don't tie heads back. I don't get on and round pin them or get off and round pin them and whatnot. But like, I am very verbal with them. Like That's I will. That's how I've always been too. Cuss them Verbally for sure. Verbally abusive towards a horse. Yes. But I could not stomach like ever being i've kicked a horse in the belly we all have had to do right that, i mean we've had to do things as horse trainers that you know someone who didn't understand the sport might frown upon but i've seen a lot of things that i could never see on a daily basis by other trainers in multiple disciplines but i am very verbal agree. so i think being a horse trainer is what has made me be a person who curses quite a bit yeah if i ever see blood but, in the corner of a horse's mouth i lose my shit yeah yeah but i will call a horse a dumb mother yeah oh no of. there's a yeah we have yeah I know. So it's different they don't understand it no they don't understand it it's for your own mental clarity I, exactly it's just for me to like get some of that out and then i can go on without taking it out on them physically so it's just yeah. verbal yep there's nothing worse than like getting a like getting a horse in from somebody and going to like put the bridle on it and they do this. Right, they like, freak out. Yeah, it's the saddest thing ever. I know. Nuts. You can tell when one's been abused or whatnot. So hard so, to fix it. Yeah. Luckily, in our industry, I don't think we run into that a whole lot anymore. Like not as much as a few years ago. Right. I think it's just like it's become there's so much finesse to be able to win now, and our sport has like elevated to such a height. Like you cannot train a horse to win if they're winning if they're doing it out of fear. Like they have to truly want to. They do. I mean they're bred to want to. Yeah, That's they're one bred thing to want to realize. And, like they yep. they come out like with just an instinct to do exactly what they've been bred to do, which is just amazing. You can mess with genetics that much. I uh, agreed a hundred percent. I mean, who'd have thought you could breed a horse to want to run and turn a barrel, a non moving object, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. That they can connect to. Yeah. And it's not just barrel work. They're doing it with like every industry horse and yep. bulls. And it's just wild to see the evolution of the oh, animals. Oh, bulls. And yeah. I mean, cutting is so bred into a horse. I mean, where they have a lot of cow and like, but some, some disciplines like, like reining, like they're more mechanical. Like those horses are truly like trained and trained and trained and trained and trained every single day to go and do that stuff. Granted they can, they're built to slide better than my barrel horses, but still it's, there's, so much training involved in that. I think more so than, you know, barrel racing or cutting or whatever. Not that we don't have to train our horses, but at some point instinct is allowed to take over, I think, a little bit more. It's maybe a little less mechanical, but. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. But to me, like, and I like, I like watching a great calf horse more than I like watching anything. 
but I mean, barrel horses are right there for me. Like you, you just see a horse do something incredible because to ask a horse to go into like Thomas and Mac, for instance, right. Go nine Oh to that first barrel. I mean, turn it faster than you can, your eye can barely process. Right. Beat a second and third and out of there and getting dang close to 12 seconds. Yeah. I don't even understand that. No, it is pretty incredible, but I'm with you on the calf horses too. Like yeah. they have, they have to do it all without anybody on their back. I mean, it, uh, they have a lot of discipline. Like I highly respect a good calf horse. Yeah. And, and you're in a calf horse's face just by nature of what you're doing a lot more than you are in a barrel horse's face, if you know how to stay out of a barrel horse's face. But right. you just are just by nature of what's going on. Yeah. It's just amazing to watch them work. Mm -hmm. but we could talk about like that forever. This is the most horse stuff I have talked about on one of my podcasts ever. I know. Like I don't, li like I said, I don't really listen to them, but you were going on and on oh, about how you, you don't talk about horse stuff. So I'm just sitting here going, I don't know what we're going to talk about fashion. I don't know. Makeup. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. You thought you were going to talk we go. about makeup? I didn't know. It was like, I, it was like the sky's the limit, but it's not going to be horses. Yeah. I don't know. It was the right time and the right mood. You were the right person to get it out, I guess. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe. But you did waste a drink, so that's going to cost you. Riley, get the credit card scanner out. It's not done yet. <laughs> it's not done yet. Still going. I, it's probably a good I'm place. I'm a slow drinker. I'm not a drunk. That's a quality, right? Yeah, well, at the pace that you're drinking, there's no possible way you could ever be drunk. That's my goal. It's my goal. <laughs> it's a good goal, I guess, depending on. That's probably why you, well, you never said you had a hard time dating, but like a guy could never feed you drinks. It would never work. Uh, no, absolutely not, 100%. I'd always be one step ahead. No, I'm behind, technically. He would be passed out on the floor drunk trying to get you drunk, and you just have to leave. Which ultimately puts me ahead. The next morning, it certainly Like, does. I am yeah. in control of the situation at all times. Yeah. You have his phone number deleted and be back home, and he would just be waking up like, where'd she go? Exactly. Why does this seat smell like this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Our theme song is by Shay Ashire and the Night Howlers. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.